Thank you so much, Lana. Thank you, everybody, for being here with me tonight. Um, and I have to admit that uh, this is going to be a one-man show, so uh, or a one-woman show. So please be patient because I have to deal with a lot of technology and um, different stuff. But I think it's going to be fine. So. Um, why epics and choreography or why epics and dance? And um, first of all, my interest in epics comes from their poetic nature, from their um, nature, which is in between orality and written form, and from um, my ignorance at the beginning about how epics were performed. But starting reading and researching, I found out a lot of similarities or analogies between contemporary choreography, dramaturgy, and the way epics were performed. So despite these uh, commonalities or um, common um, points, uh, Homeric epics and contemporary dance are two distinct and different media and artworks and uh, two different knowledge systems. So I'm dealing with them as two different worlds, but um, the, the reason I'm interested in their meeting is because uh, on one hand, I have noticed that in um, scholarship of epics, the embodiment and the role of the body is becoming even more crucial about interpreting the epics and the performance of them. And on the other hand, in contemporary choreography, the use of language is something that comes up very vividly in um, works. And there is also the concept of language choreography, which expands the choreography from the body to the um, uh, choreography of the words and how these can play with the imaginary and with the potential of um, conceiving body and mind in a different manner. So this is my entry point to the discussion and my presentation today, and also some similarities that I want to uh, highlight because poetry and dance have all um, often been um, compared uh, by philosophers like Paul Valéry, who is in philosophy of dance, have written about poetry and dance being complementary one to the other, because both are practices that build their own world by making, by performing, and they both have a poetic language which transcends representation alone. Uh, rhythm and this poetic language, which is more open and more, more inclusive like, um, than um, um, literary uh, language is something uh, interests me a lot. And also uh, the fluidity and the ephemerality of the dance form resembles the um, fluidity and the ephemerality of the oral language which is also um, something the two worlds share. This is an excerpt from Iliad uh, about the moment when Patroclus is going to be killed. And especially after Apollo, the god had intervened into the battle, taken away from him was his breast breastplate removed by Lord Apollo, son of Zeus, and his mind was seized by aberration, his limbs failed him, and he just stood there in a daze. So this is an extract where the god and the hero are coming into contact, their words becoming relational and disperse, and Patroclus is becoming um, united with the praxis and the interference of God Apollo. He's, touch, touch, um, he's touching and manipulating his armor 
And through this body-to-body -body interaction, Patroclus is affected forever. How does it feel to be fatally touched by a god? How bodily perception and thinking can be affected by such an event? So I start by chapter one. Thrust your torso and weight forward, balancing on one leg. Suspend yourself and now think of the top of your head. Your head is your heaviest part. Let your torso, head, weight drop on a bent leg forward and exhale. Let your arms swing. This is a drop. It has coordination. It has a rhythmic pattern. It has a flow and dynamics. One, two, three, two, two, three, three, two, three. Counting my modern dance teacher in order for us to go to start doing, to start doing a drop exercise. I was nine years old. I stood there still. Everybody else was doing the exercise except myself. That was embarrassing. I was caught in between this pulse of movement and its language. A language that was trying to encapsulate its rhythm. I was petrified. This split between the numbers of the rhythm, the language and the pulse caused me confusion. After that, I repeated this movement again and again and again. Every day, each time the same but different. Each time with the force of the abandonment directed by the rhythm of my breathing and the play of my weight. How a torso drops how Patroclus' torso fell. What's the difference between a drop and a fall? Bruno Snell, in his discovery of the mind, the Greek origins of European thought, presented this sketch of body, human body, that seems to have no center, but has only limbs with strong muscles separated from each other by means of exaggerated joints. Alex, Alex Purvis argues that for both the poet and the vase painter who made this figure, the body is multiple. It does not make sense to consider it as an individual unit in isolation from the other bodies that, that surround it and whose gestures it shares. Indeed, it would be better to envision the Homeric body as an entity, not formed from centers or parts, but through movement. So through movement, through fall, we can conceive and imagine the body of Patroclus falling down to earth, dying. And by the same token, we can imagine the body of a dancer to fall. As Annie, Annie Sal Ness notes, um, it's a little bit awkward to hear somebody say, I did a fall. Most likely a person would say, I took a fall. 
So that means that there is an attitude of acceptance, an attitude of letting the force of gravity leading your body to the ground. And if the Homeric body is conceived through movement, this center of the body that is missing in the figure is discovered by modern dance, starting from Isadora Duncan onwards. And especially Doris Humphrey, who was one of the mother figures of modern dance, developed a dance technique based on fall and recovery. And she conceived this a special way of moving, moving as an arch between two deaths, where one death is the static death of the horizontal plane, and the other one is the dynamic death of the vertical plane. But the important thing, the dance itself, comes between those two deaths, the triumph of recovery from the fall occurs at the moment of suspension. When the person asserts his freedom from the powers of nature, as he, she used to say. At this moment of suspension, breathing is the necessary element. And breathing can be felt in all body parts. We can breathe with the knees, with the arms, with the whole body. But can falling be learned? How can I learn falling? How can we learn to fall? Nancy Stark Smith, one of Steve Paxton's collaborators on in contact improvisation, a technique that uses falling on the ground as one of the major actions that dancers can do, describe falling as follows. When I first started following by choice, I noticed, I, not, I noticed a blind spot. Somewhere after the beginning and before the end of the fall, there was darkness. And then the floor. Luckily, there, was, there were mats on the floor. Soon I learned that at the end of the fall was the beginning of another movie, you move, move usually a roll. That gave me something to go, so I rolled. At the end of the roll was another roll, and at the end of that, another. Then I noticed another blind spot. Somewhere after the beginning and before the end of the roll, there was darkness, like death. In that darkness, however, I noticed a body moving, a body that knew just where to go. So this repetition of falling, this repetition of leaving the body to the gravity and hit the ground, this repetition leads to a mastering and an, an emancipation that has to do with directionality and a sense of control within the loss of control. This is a system of notation initiated by Raoul Auger Foyer in the early 18th century, where we can see a floor pattern. He decided to describe movement by placing how the body is moving on the floor on the horizontal plane. And this is part of a long theory of dancing that conceives the body and the space into two different planes, the horizontal and the vertical. And this is another approach to how falling can happen because before realizing the falling, we could, we could also realize our alignment and our upright posture. So this system of notation indicates how our posture is moving into the horizontal plane 
and how this notation tries to capture what the body is doing on this plane. A little bit after that, Carlo Blasis, who was an um, Italian ballet master, wrote a book called An Elementary Treatise Upon the Theory and Practice of the Art of Dancing, where we can see that he draws how the human body can be aligned into this vertical axis and especially how this vertical axis can provide the balance of the human body in motion, in moving situations and positions. And there are specific rules on how to do that. In the first picture on the left, we can see that bodily equilibrium is achieved through the perpendicular where the axis uh, imaginary starts from the collarbone and goes down between the ankles of both feet. While on our right side picture, we can see if the body wants to move into space and throw the, the weight in different ways, but also to have this upright position balancing on one foot, we have to devise our weight into two different directions equally so we can balance. And this is pure physics in a way. But dancer moves with mental imaginary, with sensation, with physical action, by observation and perception that frames is moving into the world and the world is framed by its movement. In that way, dancing is not a metaphor for something like thinking, but it's itself a sensorial and intellectual thinking in a moving body. So it exists through the body. It is situated within, its, uh, within it and its context and is actual, actualized through performance. I propose that Equally, the epic character and the rhapsode is performing the choreography of the formulaic verses, the conventions of the epic competitions and the performance of his own abilities of narration. So the rhapsode's body, his physical, social and aesthetic presence and the bodies of the characters in the epic poems overlap, interweave, and come into a shifting dialogue. Dancer Chrisa Parkinson argues that no form can create a reality of its own. So there are, for example, artists whose work is based on anatomical Western medical research, some other ask questions about aesthetics or political contexts. Other delve into their own bodies. So the poles are essentialism and relativism. And we try to move between these two extremes. While another dancer and Alexander technique teacher Miranda Tafnel suggests that Images that appear offer a sense not just of the moving itself, but also of the wider context of our lives. And this is Eve Klein, a visual artist who in the 60s made this photograph of himself leaping in, into the void. And of course, that's a photomontage. It, it was taken twice, the photo one with the trampoline um, at the ground and one without it. So this is not actually what it really happened to the artist, but this is an attempt to bring life and art into a common uh, vessel. And this leap into the void seems uh, to be really happening 
while this um, photo, the falling man, by um, a person um, falling from the um, World Trade Centers on um, 11th of September, 2011. It's a real fall that goes beyond uh, formality and goes beyond this um, artistic approach. So that's a form that transcends our imagination of aesthetics, but links to our bodies and what ha can happen to people falling. Maxine Sheets Johnston, who is a um, phenomenologist of dance, states that each dance presents an illusion of force, which is always present, yet never totally present any more than the dance is totally present at any one moment or point. This is because the actual components of force are transformed. They are no longer isolated and dis distinct factors of actual movement, but interrelated qualities of virtual force. They are qualities rather than actual components because the form in which they exist is totally differentiated in form. So this is what makes a, a falling in artistic terms different. But despite the differences, this moment of falling brings up another timing, another sense of how time can be experienced. And as Paul Virilion uh, writes in his introduction to Open Sky, in addition to the passing time of the longest durations, we can add a time which is exposed instantaneously. And this is the falling time. The time of the shortest durations in the realms of electromagnetism and of gravity. And because he's um, writing about the Renaissance and the painters who discovered how to um, put the third dimension in their paintings, he um, argues that um, the original reference points for sight is therefore not what the Italian masters said it was, that of vanishing lines converging on the horizon, but one bound up with a delicate balancing act of a universal attraction, which imposes on it jeering towards the center of the earth at the risk of our falling. And as Victor Hugo puts it, the rope doesn't hang, the earth pulls. So now we are leading to the third chapter, which is the limbs. And I am going to stand up and whoever wants to do the same, please, you are welcome. And I'm going to play and share with you um, a short description by Steve Paxton. This is standing. Let your butt be heavy. Relax the internal organs. Down into the bowl of the pelvis. Breathe easy. Feel the weight of your arms. Feel the spine rising through the shoulders and up to support the skull. At the center of standing, you observe some small movements. I call this the small dance. This seems to be a reflexive action, especially around the joints 
to keep you upright even though you're very relaxed. You could decide to fall, but not yet. You're watching yourself stand. Easy breathing. Shoulder blades heavy, buttocks heavy. Feel the breathing. Let the organs down into the bowl of the pelvis. Let the spine rise to support the skull. In the direction that your arms are hanging, without changing that direction, do the smallest stretch that you can feel. Release it. Try it again. Can it be smaller? The bare initiation of stretch. Release it. Once more, in the direction that your arms are hanging without changing that direction, the smallest stretch that you can feel. Can it be smaller? Think of it going past your fingerprints, through the tips of the fingers. Then, if that's where it goes, where have you started this stretch? In the arm, for instance, or in the shoulder? Remember this sensation. Going up the back from the coccyx, the sacrum, the lumbar, the thoracic, the cervical, all the way up to the atlas between the ears, do the smallest step that you can feel. Release it. Once again, can it be smaller? And this is because we are standing, but standing is not so stable that it seems. It's a small dance, like Steve Paxton describes, and it also has these noises behind, these small movements that happen in our bodies because we are still alive and we haven't fallen in, in the horizontal plane, which is a position you, we usually take when we sleep, occasionally when we make love and we are, when we are dead. And I would like to conclude by saying that this embodiment of heroes and the Rhapsode, myself, Steve Paxton, you, is because our subjectivities are formed in relation to each other, in relation to our gravity, and in relation to our breathing. And I conclude by sharing a video by the choreographer Androniki Marathaki, who is with us today, and is one of my collaborators. And I really thank her for this video. And this is about our presence and our essence for being here all together.
So that was my presentation. I just want to add that I, I tried to, to make a presentation following some rules. First of all, to rely a lot on language as uh, the epic performance, and also to use the um, excerpt I, I initiated at the beginning as a score, uh, where I divided three different parts because the score, the extract was um, referring to three different body parts. So the first chapter was the torso dealing with the fall. The second was about the mind. And there I decided to talk about this uh, geometrical conception of dance theory of the planes and the moving body um, on these planes. And the, the third part was the limbs. So this part goes with Steve Paxton and his small dance and standing position. So that was my thoughts. <laughs>